Welcome everyone to this week's Hot and Cold show where we cover the hot and cold market trends in the comic community. With me as always is my co-host Jack DeMeo aka Mr. Bolo. What's going on buddy? Oh Brian, you know what? We got a great list this week. I'm really excited to bring this one to the people and we've just about got a full roster of uh, pickers this week. So definitely excited. We do have a guest pick this week but we're going to keep that a surprise but it's important to know that this show is brought to you from CBSI Swag. Check out CBSISwag.com to get those CBSI t-shirts, hats, beanies, all that good stuff. And while you're at it, use the code HOTCOLD10 and save yourself 10%. There's a link to the site in the description of this video as well as that code word to use. But without further ado, we're going to jump right into this list right now. Starting with the man we're welcome to have back to the show. And that is Andy Spotlight Writer, Andy Tomerlin. Hey, what's up, everybody? Andy here with ComicBookInvest.com, Indie Spotlight Series. What's hot this week? Uh, to me, it seems like the previews and ash cans are seeing a big movement right now. Um, when you take a few examples like the uh, Powers of Ten, House of X, Seeds of Tomorrow, free promotional book that was given out, uh, you're seeing that that book go for ten dollars right now. Uh, another example is Undiscovered Country, uh, the title that was recently optioned. Uh, you're seeing the San Diego Comic-Con version go for like $90 right now. And uh, it, it seems to be a trend that's been happening for a while. Uh, we, we saw it a couple months ago with the, the farmhand news. Uh, the ash can was definitely outselling the cover A and every other, every other one there was. Uh, so something to look out for. And uh, also be aware of the G.I. Joe number one that has an ash can out there. There's very few of them that pop up on eBay and they're they're selling pretty quick when they do. That has a first appearance in it. And uh, and the, the, the series has Death of Duke in there. So definitely one to watch out for. Um, but what's hot this week? Uh, previews and ash cans right now. So our first hot pick tonight, we are talking previews and ash cans. They do get hot. My only thing is, the trend that I see, we're talking current trends, so it makes this hot list and it makes a great pick. But the long-term trend, I see a lot of these ash cans, they spike, especially when news comes out for it. If there's option news or new comic book news or a title gets hot, everyone goes and hunts those ash cans. Those previews, they get hot for a while, but they never really sustain that. They always come right back down. They hold some value, but they don't keep that value that they get when they first spike when that news breaks. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, you know, I tend to agree with you. I think the thing about it is, is it's one of those topics, um, one that's near and dear, I know, to our Topher S, uh, the mass speculator, Mr. True First himself, um, his heart. But, you know, they're, they're one of those kind of true first things where I think the reason they pop is, is twofold. First off, it's essentially a first appearance because these books come out prior to the books released. Um, secondly, the low print run. They tend to have a much lower print run than the regular issue number one. So they spike for those reasons. But I think the reasons why you mentioned why they don't always sustain value is because they don't always have the same, I will say, demand across the marketplace because there's still a lot of people in that boat that they're, they're not first appearances. They don't hold the same value as that number one. And they don't, they don't put that same energy and effort into, say, trying to collect or have all of these previews and ash cans. The other thing is a lot of people aren't even aware of all of them. Um, so the, you know, the education of the market and making sure people know how many people were even aware that G.I. Joe number one had an ash can or other books like um, that Ghostbusters Transformers crossover that that has an ash can. Um, you know, books like that, I think it. It takes till after the spike for news to get out and for people really to be aware that these books even exist. Um, now, advanced copies, that's a little different. We're seeing serious heat on advanced copies, like he mentioned, the Undiscovered Country, um, San Diego Comic-Con version. Another one that I think of is Once in Future. That's obviously a book we've talked about a lot. Now, that book is a prime example of what you're talking about, Brian. That was a $175 book for a moment. It's now about a $50 to $60 book. Now, if that gets optioned again, I have no doubt it will shoot up. And the important thing to note about fifty or sixty dollar book is it's still five to six times what the first print is going for. So, you know, that's something to be be of note. But here's the thing: there was a time when it was going for three times what the one per store variant was going for, and now it's going for about the same. As the one per store variant hasn't dropped down to the same level that that um, that 
advanced copy did. So I think the market is kind of still open and out on where we're going, how we're going to view these books and where they're going to end up landing. But nonetheless, it's a great hot pick. These books are hot. And if you get an opportunity to pick up, whether it's the freebie advanced copies or ash cans that your LCS has to give out, if you're able at a convention to buy advanced copies of uh, you know upcoming independent releases i really think that that is a sound investment i really think that over time it's a lottery ticket but one that can pay off with huge dividends based on what we've seen in the market of of late right great pick definitely hits that market trend right now and we're gonna move on to the next pick which comes from our guest picker this week and we are what and we are glad to welcome back carolina chris 26 from the Carolina Chris 26 YouTube channel. Let's check out what he's got for us this week. Hey right, guys, I'm Carolina Chris, and this is my hot pick of the week. That's right, you heard the man. It's time for my hot pick of the week. My hot pick of the week is Titans. DC's Titans. Now, if you haven't seen season one, this show is crazy. I love it. It's one of my favorite shows to watch on Friday night. Season two is slated to be one heck of a show as well. We've already got a lot of great heroes. We've got a lot of great villains. The big bad villain of season two is Slade Wilson Deathstroke. Now, Deathstroke's first appearance is New Teen Titans issue two. Already had reported sales of around... $133 for a very fine condition book sold this month, uh, $96 for very fine plus, and a near mint copy sold for $160 this month alone. Now, say go back to June 25th, a very fine copy sold for $76, a very good copy sold for $66, and another very good copy sold for $48. Then we had copies in between, in July, sold in between $74 to $77. So this book has been picking up steam, but I believe it's been picking up steam ever since we've known that Deathstroke was going to be in Season 2. So that leads us to our next next character This uh, I believe, is heating up. And that's Tale of the Teen Titans 44. Um, CGC 9.8 copies have been selling for around $200 to $220 this month alone, but they've been holding strong in the 200 since June. Um, but I believe since season one ended and we knew we were getting a Nightwing once Dick Grayson burned his Robin outfit, we knew we was going to get a Nightwing regardless. So I believe this book has really been picking up since then. You really can't find a copy below, uh, 40 bucks or 50 bucks if you're lucky. You know, not a great copy, a near mint copy. You're going, you're going to pay a little bit for, it. and it's steadily, steadily heating up. You know, because we're getting, there's already been uh, leaked pictures of Dick Grayson in the black and blue Nightwing outfit, so we're getting Nightwing this season for sure. Which leads me to our next character um, is Deathstroke, the Terminator, uh, fifteen, published in 1992. This is the first appearance of Rose Wilson, who later becomes Ravager. Uh, books have been selling for in between 12 to 30 and, and more on eBay here lately. Now, we've already got Rose Wilson. They, they introduced her in episode two, but they actually showed her without, with her eye, where it's, I guess it's cut out. You know what I mean? It was a slit across her eyelid. It didn't look like it was ripped out, but I'm pretty sure her eye, eyeball's gone. Um, so yeah, um, that's another character. Um, and we're getting a Ravager. We've already had leaked photos of her in the Ravager suit, or a stunt double, but somebody was in the Ravager outfit. Leads me to my next book, Teen Titans 1 Half, uh, first cover appearance of Rose Wilson as Ravager, and the origin of Ravager. Like I said, we've already got leaked photos of Ravager on set, so we're getting a Ravager, we're getting a Nightwing, we've got a Deathstroke, my God, bro, it's like, this, this, show is going, this show's gonna be crazy, you know what I'm saying? So those books are starting to heat up a little bit, um, I've noticed here lately. And then we also have uh, Deathstroke 45, uh, it's the first appearance of Deathstroke Rose Wilson. Now, I don't know if we'll get a Rose Wilson as Deathstroke, but that might be another book to look for. Uh, Teen Titans 12, Ravager cuts her eye out to prove herself to Deathstroke. They haven't said how her eye got cut out, you know, and they haven't, they haven't explained nothing about her eye yet. And maybe that will be, because see, I believe... There's a lot of speculation that they're leading towards uh, the Judas contract. Rose is taking the place of Tara, 
So I believe they're sticking Rose in here so she can betray the Titans here eventually. And she's working for her dad the whole time. I mean, I don't know. That this is all right. It's three more characters that was mentioned in the show, and there's a couple more, but I don't have time to get into it all. We had Jericho Wilson. As uh, as it's been rumors that he's supposedly supposed to be in the show as well, and you've got his first appearance. Uh, uh, Blackfire was mentioned. Um, uh, she sent one of the royal guards to pick up Starfire to bring her back home, and they mentioned her name, Starfire. Uh, locked the royal guard in her ship. She act like she's not going to go back home. So I believe eventually we're going to get Blackfire is going to come to Earth and she's going to try to take her sister back. Um, so I, uh, her first uh, cameo appearance was New Teen Titans uh, 22 was a cameo. Her first full appearance was uh, New Teen Titans 23. So Blackfire could be another book. Now last is the one book that I've been trying to get my hands on. I believe this book has been a hot book for a good minute. And that is Batman 635. First appearance of Jason Todd as Red Hood. So everybody believes that Jason Todd's going to get killed here eventually. And we're going to get a Red Hood. I mean, it's it might not be season two. It possibly could be season three. It could be season four. But honestly believe it's going to happen. And I'm trying my best to get my hands on a copy of this book. So that is my hot pick of the week, guys. I hope I hope you agree with it. And if not, I understand. But I'm trying to get my hands on some of these books now that I do not have. And anybody got a copy of Red Hood, they're trying to let me get for the low low. Holla at your boy. Peace. Always glad to have Carolina Chris26 do a guest pick on this channel. In fact, it's so good that he's no longer doing guest picks. He's actually going to be a regular for the Hot and Cold show going forward. So we're happy to welcome Chris and his Hot and Cold picks each and every week and look forward to them. But this week we're talking Titans and he backed it up with a lot of great books. You've seen a lot of market movement, especially on those Deathstroke books. You saw a lot of movement on some of these books previously, especially with like the Arrow spec from a few years ago when you had the whole Manu Bennett thing going on. And then Rose Wilson showed up there. But what do you think about this, Jack? I love it because I love the show. Um, you know, I'm glad to see season two having a better effect on speculation than season one had. Um, season one was met with a lot of, like, like, you know, early season complaints that you tend to get with new shows. Oh, I don't like the costume. I don't like the casting. But as the show kind of found its place, um, it really kind of settled in. Uh, I didn't like, like, the Trigon casting. I wanted to see Trigon in his full form in season two. Guess what? We got it. Um, I want to see Dick Grayson as Nightwing. In season two, we're going to get that. Deathstroke is just such a natural kind of villain for the, the Titans. Uh, we get Titans Tower. Um, we're getting Rose Wilson. Like you said, Ravenger. Um, I think we're going to get Jericho. I, it looks like, uh, you know, Dr. Light was kind of like surprisingly cool with the way they did him. Um so this season has been awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm locked in for it. Glad to see the, the DC app still kind of fight in for relevancy here. Um, and, you know, I really like the Destro 45 pick. I think that's like a – that was on the bolo list. I think that's a stealth, like, co cover price pickup. I think it's only a matter of time before we see Rose Wilson take that um, helm in some sort of media because in every depiction of Slade Wilson, he's always older. Um, he tends to be sick. He tends to um, – Looks like you Snake know, from Metal Gear. <laughs> yeah yeah you know it's it, it, you know they for instance in the show they thought he was dead um so i think that's good spec that's something that could one day really pay off so if you see those covers either cover a or cover b for you know cover price i think that's a great pickup i have some um that's one of those you know you grab and you stick in a short box and you just you wait that one out but either way that series is also a great read that deathstroke series um from christopher priest was amazing um but, yeah, it's, it's good to see these books getting hot. It's also good to talk about a DC spec play, Brian. I mean, it seems like we're never talking DC comics. Um, and, you know, leave it to Carolina Chris to risk life and limb in a, a ring of fire to bring us this incredible uh, hot pick to talk about and uh, bring a little DC spec into our lives. Yeah, not only was his pick hot, but Chris looked pretty hot when he just about set himself on fire. <laughs> <laughs> right, burning the leg hairs with that one. <laughs> but, and with that, we're moving on to the next pick on the hot list this week, and it comes from Comic Man Andy. What's up, Comic Book Nation? Brian? Jack? I'm back. I got a hot pick this week. My hot pick is going to be Golden Age books. Why? Well, there's not a week that doesn't go by that I don't hear 
about an auction ending where uh, some books are going for way more than what people anticipated. Um, you know, look out for a lot of those channels on YouTube that do shows specifically on Golden Age comic books. You know, the Golden Guys on Comic Core. Uh, there's DS Comics who does a lot with Golden Age books, and uh, it seems like every week they're talking about books that just kind of catch them by surprise as far as the prices they're going for. Why are they hot? Who knows? Supply, demand. Um, the prices just keep going and going and going, but the demand just doesn't let up. It's there, and people are paying serious money for these books now, more so than they were in the past. So that's my hot pick for the week, guys. Remember, Pinky's out. Peace out. Catch you on the flip side. So real quick, before we get into Andy's pick, I want to give a shout out to the t-shirt he was wearing. It's that Valhalla project that goes towards preventing veteran suicide. Valhalla project, great charity to support, especially if you're a Marine Corps veteran. I know Andy's a Marine Corps veteran. A lot of veterans out there. Veteran suicide's a big thing. Not to kill the mood right now, but shout out to Andy for that shirt and supporting that Valhalla project. But his pick, Golden Age Books. It's one of those books that you can almost have on the list week in and week out because Golden Age, there's always hot Golden Age books. And it also goes to that classic thing where those big keys or those bigger books are way out of people's price range. So now you're seeing even low-end, low-grade Golden Age pretty much get out of people's budget as well. Especially when you're talking pre-code horror, pre-code crime. Which if you want to see top 50 pre-code horror books, we do have a video for that on Simple Man's Comics channel. I'll put a card up here right now and a link to it in the description. But Jack, we're talking Golden Age. What do you got for us? Well, you know, I think that there's a lot of reasons Golden Age is spiking, right? First off, you know, we discussed this in our Discord Patreon chat. That's a, that's a benefit of being a, a Patreon supporter of the channel is we do regular chats um, where you have kind of open access to discuss with the group and with Brian and I things in the hobby, what's going on. Um, and we talked about Andy's pick last night. And, um, you know, Andy was like, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know why this is happening. But we d discussed a little bit about collectors, you know, maybe who feel like they've, they've already done the modern thing and they want to level up. But also, I think it's the amount of coverage that Golden Age is currently getting. Um, first off, shout out to CBS Islander Ben C., who has done consistent Golden Age coverage since he started working with the site, even before he owned the site. Yeah. He is. Like, for a while there, I thought he was Golden Age. Turns out he's like the same age. Yeah, I was shocked <laughs> when I first found out how old he was. I Because, again, that and Brian, it's you know, you just led me right to my point. Most Golden Age people tend to be of a certain age, right? You know, you see... I've, I set up at uh, conventions and all the golden age dealers tend to be, um, you know, the older crowd, uh, they don't tend to even have that modern knowledge, right? That that's not their game. Um, they're playing in a sort of a, a kind of smaller sandbox um, and they're attracting customers that are of a certain age. Um, but I think a lot of that's changing. First off, you have somebody like uh, Ben Stein, who writes the CBSI Hot 10 list. And he does one pick in the honorable mentions. Every single week, he tries to add a Golden Age book in there, highlight a Golden Age book. But again, we talk about like, you know, transparency and supporting other YouTubers. And I'm going to tell you one that I think has had a huge effect on the market. And I think he's got people at a, from all age groups buying um, Golden Age books. And especially what you mentioned, Brian, those like lower end kind of like entry level golden age books and that's jeff itzig um also known as the golden age guru who you can see on the comic tom 101 youtube channel um i think he has had an incredible effect on the market i think he has really got the attention of a lot of people and, and maybe inspired some people to check out golden age books um you know he's a knowledgeable guy but it's kind of like what you said like you expect to see people who do that of a certain age when he's a real young guy. He's a, a guy our age. Um, I'm not sure exactly how old he is, but he, he looks like a guy our age. Um, he talks like we talk. He's not, you know, like the typical guy you see at a convention dealing in these books. And when he explains these books, he explains them in a manner that um, is real kind of like short, succinct, and understandable. And um, he does it with a passion. So I think he's had a great effect on the market. And um, 
you know, getting more people involved in that market. And that's something that we didn't see previously. We didn't see a lot of like when the younger collectors entered the market, they t- we t- all tend to stick with what our childhood is, right? Brian and I, you, you and I talk all the time about getting the nostalgia feels. If you see something from the 80s, you're all over it. If I see something from that late 80s, early 90s, I'm all over it. Um, it's different. It's it's more difficult even to get guys to go into something that's far before they would have ever been impacted in their childhood to purchase something. And that's what I think we're seeing with the increased amount of content, whether it's on social media, whether it's on YouTube covering um, Golden Age product. I think there's even another um, – there's a, a YouTube channel dedicated – just to Golden Age. Uh, I think Andy mentioned it to me in the Discord chat. I hadn't heard of it. Um, I apologize for not knowing the name. But let us know if you if you are in the chat right now and you remember that. Go ahead and throw that in the chat so that people can be aware of that. Um, because, again, knowledge is power. The more stuff you know, uh, the more you're going to be able to um, you know implement that into your sales strategy. I saw firsthand at Heroes Con last year Andy Tomberlin from the Indie Spotlight series. A guy who primarily deals in independent modern comic books, but he got that golden age bug, right? It bit him hard. He was buying up golden age books, selling golden age books. And that's what tends to happen is once that bug bites you, you kind of go all in on it. And then it becomes just a part of your repertoire. I'm still one of those people that if I'm, I don't feel like an expert at something, I don't like dip into it as far as speculation or flipping or reselling. And I don't feel like I yet have enough say knowledge in the golden age game to to play in that pool but i want to so i'm still i'm still watching content i'm sharpening my sword and i'm getting ready to kind of um play that game but i guess brian i gotta get moving because golden age is hot and it just seems like those prices are just gonna keep going up so golden age hot next pick what else is hot we're gonna find out right now How's it going, everybody? Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes with my hot pick this week. And this week I am going with Marvel G.I. Joe, uh, especially those numbers that are related to the upcoming Snake Eyes film. I'm really excited about this. This is sort of a childhood thing for me, and I know uh, it is for other people, Jack especially. Um, But um, I'm really just focused on the ones that have to do with that film, and there are a few that are really worth looking at. Now, that said, G.I. Joe Marvel stuff has been hot by the rabid fans for a really long time. People want this stuff regardless. It's very nostalgic. It's hard to get in good shape. This Bronze Age stuff has been sitting in bins for 20 or 30 years. Um, And so high-grade copies can be tough to get. But either way, um, you still want to have your eye on some of the keys um, that are going up slowly. They haven't seen any huge spikes yet, but I think they will. Um, Obviously, there's number one, which is the first appearance of a ton of characters. Snake Eyes' first appearance, Scarlet, Cobra Commander, uh, Baroness, um... Hawk, Grunt, uh, the list goes on and on. There's a ton of characters that make their first appearance in here. Um, And it's also a tough book because it's thick, so it's tough to get in good shape because of that as well. There's also, of course, the famed Silent Issue, which is the first appearance of Storm Shadow. It's also the first appearance, and I'm going to butcher this, and I'm really sorry, uh, of the uh, Arashikage clan, or Arashikagi clan. I'm not sure how to say that. I'm sure someone will correct me, um, so I apologize. It's the one that has no dialogue in it, Um, and it's also really tough because of this really dark cover, and there are multiple printings of this, so be aware of the multiple printings. They should be fairly easy to spot. They differ quite a lot from this first printing, um, but do keep your eye open for that. There's also the two origin issues, 26 and 27, um, that are important. Uh, This is also the first appearance of the Hard Master and Soft Master, and this one is the first appearance of Snake Eyes' Wolf Timber. Um, And then I have a sleeper pick, which is this number 46, which I just think is a fantastic Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow cover that I think uh, people will latch on to eventually. So uh, all those books, and there's, and there's others as well, that I think are going to continue to be hot, and they're going to go up e- uh, even more exponentially as we get trailers and more news. So that's my hot pick for the week. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. So there it is, Mike Morello, who writes the Cover Tunes article on comicbookinvest.com, talking G.I. Joe, not just regular G.I. Joe. We're talking that old older Marvel G.I. Joe at first, I wasn't sure about this pick, but then it kind of made sense. You're seeing the, the Snake Hunt, the G.I. Joe current IDW run, getting pretty hot right now. You saw him relaunch the G.I. Joe number one, which Andy mentioned in his hot pick, has an Ashcam 4. But then I think a lot of people are seeing that, and then they're getting 
hitting the feels and the nostalgia and just basic comic book. They're going back to that old Marvel run and starting to pick up keys from that. Because not only what we just talked about, but then they just announced basically a new movie universe coming out with G.I. Joe. Right, yeah. I mean, you got two movies on the way. So you've got the Snake Eyes solo movie as well as a team movie. Um, and all of those reasons are reasons why sales are spiking. And it's funny. I wrote an article for comicbookinvest.com. I write the, the obviously the CBSI Bolo article, and I have the back issue Bolo section. And I did kind of a highlight of all the important first appearances in issues one through 25. In doing that, there was several comments that were like, ah, oh, he's just doing G.I. Joe because he likes it. Obviously, you know, my logo is G.I. Joe Inspired. You guys on the channel know I love G.I. Joe. Um, it's my thing. And yes, this is something I've been waiting for. But the reality is, setting up at conventions, um, you're seeing the trend. Uh, you're seeing more G.I. Joe books on the wall. And not just first appearances. I see number two on the wall all the time. Uh, number three, those early issues. And yeah, they're they're largely printed. That's the thing. The other thing that haters are going to say. But what they're missing is that first appearance for a second appearance. Or for a second print. First print for a second print. The first print is going to have kind of like that newsstand look. The second print is going to have that like black Spider-Man silhouette. But to be honest with you, prices kind of go pretty similarly on eBay. I don't think like the mass market is aware of this, but dealers will charge a premium for those first prints. And the other thing is GI Joe was largely targeted towards children. And because of that, many of these books aren't in great shape. Um, so getting those like premium issues in premium condition isn't easy. Um, some other books that I, I sell exceptionally well are 11 and 14, the cameo and first full of Destro. Um, Destro is incredibly important, obviously, to, you know, he's probably the second most uh, important villain behind uh, Cobra Commander. Um, but you've also got, like, um, 22 has a ton of important first appearances in it. Um, you, you know, uh, he mentioned 26 and 27, that those are as important as any first appearance that exists because that G.I. Joe Snake Eyes solo movie is essentially going to tell the story that happens in those. Um, also, there's there's fun things like um, number 48, the first appearance of Sergeant Slaughter. Um, if you grew up watching the cartoon, Sergeant Slaughter, we may not ever see Sergeant Slaughter in a movie, but if you grew up watching the cartoon or you grew up a WWE fan, how important was Sergeant Slaughter? I mean, he, to us, he was as big as it got. And um, he shows up in the comics. He exists in the comics. Um, and we're starting to see the fact that G.I. Joe fans, I've been telling you guys this on the channel for, Brian, what now, a year, are rabid and they're completionists. That was a great hot pick from Mike Morello. And our next hot pick comes from Peter Renna. What's going on, everybody? This is Peter Renna bringing you my hot pick for this week. And while some of you might be tired of hearing about it, I'm not sick of reading these books. And right now, my hot pick would have to be the reader buzz associated with Hickman's run on House of X and Powers of X. I mean, everything from these, you know, connecting covers are hot, from that's the first issue to one of the more recently, this issue four, connecting covers are selling, to going back to first appearance of Moira McTaggart is moving, to these uh, Omega Clan, these got hot for a little bit. Just related to books. This isn't stuff based on movie spec or anything like that. Just actually reading the books. Nimrod's first appearance, eh, heated up a little bit. Put it in Dollar Bin Digging not that long ago. And speaking of which, I also put these Phalanx books in there. 305 and 312. Might as well throw 313 in there as well. And uh, even just going through some of the villains, or maybe even a hero, if you look at them in this uh, story, and that's Apocalypse. You know, that movie almost killed his spec completely, but these books are moving again. These are, you know, getting back to about $40, $50 for the set, where they were next to nothing not that long ago. And we're looking at the Son of Krakoa and those little pod people that could be tying back into this Excalibur number 31. That spec that's getting driven off just this run alone. And recently we're getting gold balls. That's right, gold balls. Only Hickman can make gold balls an intriguing character with these little seeds that he's planting. And uh, looking ahead, this week we got a new issue coming out that's got Mr. Sinister on the cover, so Mr. Sinister's also moving pretty good right now. I mean, it's all based on the stories, which has me really excited and just, 
I can't tell you how much I love comic books, and I love the X-Men, and I'm so glad to have them back to a level where I actually want to read it. I didn't care about gold, blue, red, and all that nonsense. I tried, but I just couldn't get through it. I just got bored. But this run really has me intrigued, and these books are selling. A lot of people are on board, and you can see there's a lot of excitement, and hopefully, you know, this keeps going. Keep the momentum going. Let's see what else we've got coming. But uh, unfortunately, this run's almost over, but for still, right now, X-Books, related to the reader buzz, hot. So here we have Peter Renner talking about well, I won't say Peter Renner. Here we have the entire comic book marketplace right now talking about John Hickman's X-Men run. Powers of X, House of X, or Powers of Ten, however people are going to call it. But I'm calling it Powers of X because if that's the case, if it's Powers of Ten, then I'm just going to start calling them Ten Men. But either way, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. So be it. Won't be the first time. <laughs> but either way, Hickman's run, popular. He brought up a good point. It is nice to see spec be driven off of actual books and stories right now rather than a movie option news. But what do you think about this, Jack? Well, I totally agree. I think um, I think we're seeing that across the board, though. Um, if you look at Absolute Carnage, if you look at um, a lot of what went on with like Immortal Hulk, um, this Venom stuff, we're seeing so much um, of a return to reader buzz. And Brian, I feel like two handsome gentlemen on a certain YouTube channel – predicted this uh, i don't know about a year ago and uh, and um you know here we are and we're seeing it kind of come to fruition read your comics um that we're in a renaissance as far as quality comics i feel like there's so many great written comics um and hickman's um x-men run has been received in that light um people are loving it uh it's brought so much fervor back to the x-men i'm almost getting tired of talking about it ryan because i feel like we talk about it on the last call show we talk about it here we talk about it on the bolo list there's a new issue every every week we're going to be talking about it tomorrow on the bolo show for yeah. sure so with that let's just move on to the next hot pick <laughs> i'm with it i think we, i mean we talked about it enough we mentioned enough i think peter did an outstanding job of explaining his pick yeah we definitely agree with it i think everyone watching agrees with that pick right now everyone's hot on x-men so in the instance of keeping this shorter than normal, we're going to go right on to the next hot pick. I'm with it. What's going on, everybody? Brian McClay from CBSI Presents Tales from the Flip Side. I'm here to give my pick this week for the Hot and Cold Show, and I'm going hot, Ben Parker. There's very few things that are as hot as this Ben Parker spec right now. Uh, it shot up to number one on the CBSI Hot 10 list. Uh, ben S. Uh, did his homework, and it looks like the book that was selling for the most out of all this Ben Parker spec was the Spider-Girl book from the MC two and i'm not too sure i like that book for his biggest spec on this ben, ben parker stuff because i listened to the mass speculator he put out a kick-ass video the 10 books that are super undervalued right now that you could buy for under ten dollars or some of them even for five bucks so make sure you go check out that on simple man's channel the mass speculator said hey he did his homework he checked it out and the first Real appearance of the Ben Benjamin Benji Parker that's in this Spider Man number one, this new Spider Man tale is comes from the last Avengers story number two. And this is the real Ben Parker, the, the one that uh, he is speculating, a few other people are speculating is going to be the person in this book. So I think this is a book to look out for. I think any of the Ben Parker spec stuff is real hot. And uh, wait, who's that guy? Who is that guy? Oh, that's the mass speculator. He's a cool dude. Really cool dude. Check him out. So anyways, uh, make sure you go check out the mass speculator on Simple Man's channel. He's putting out really good stuff. Uh, to get back into this Benjamin Parker spec, I was a little bummed out when they, the news got released that it was, wasn't a Peter Parker story. It was a Ben Parker story, his son. And I get it. It's J.J. Abrams and his kid writing a story. They wanted to do the father-son type thing, so they put it into the story. That's cool and all, but I kind of feel like some of the characters that are already out there that are already wearing Spider-Man suits, uh, you should be doing stories on those people. There's good stories for those characters. Those are good characters. Let's do it. We've got Peter Parker. We've got Miles Morales. You even got Spider-Man 2099, who I think is a cool character. Then you throw in Gwen Stacy, the Spider-Gwen character. You've got Silk, who's running around out there. You've got some good characters that you can do Spider-Man stories about. And I was just a little bummed that they didn't do that. But you can't say that the spec isn't super hot. It is super hot right now. So... Uh, any of those Ben Parker spec books, go check out 
Uh, go do a deep dive down the rabbit hole with Topher on those. Check out the Mass Speculator. Big shout out to Brian and Jack, who is Simple Man's Comics, doing good things. FOC show, killing it, guys. And, of course, the Mass Speculator, he's killing it. Great video. And I'm out. I'm off to the force to go find my soul. So make sure you check out Tales from the Flip Side every Monday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and the CBSI Hot 10 Breakdown Show every Friday night at 11 p.m. Eastern. I'm out. Hopefully I'll come back. So there we have Brian McKay from CBSI Presents Tales from the Flip Side. Also the podcast, if you saw in his video, he's on... I think he's on every he's on a bunch of podcasts, right? But I know he's on CBSI Presents Tales from the Flip Side Monday nights at 9.30 as well as the CBSI Hot 10 show that's Friday nights at 11. But he's also evidently a tutor because he's making sure everyone does their homework according to that video. But great stuff. We're talking about Benji Parker. Benji Parker right now is hot, especially after Spider-Man number one came out last week, the whole J.J. Abrams and his son. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, Brian, I think you know what I think about this pick. And I think anybody who watched the channel last week knows what I think about this pick. My long-term play of the week was Spider-Man number one, the issue that has inspired all of this speculation. Um, and I said with that long-term uh, pick of the week that there was going to be some discussion about this first appearance. We had, you know, that Spider-Girl 59 takeoff to baby appearance. Would there be some market correction? Um, it looks like while there's some people putting their money into Avengers last story number two, not much money as it's like a five to ten dollar book as Topher highlighted in the video right here on this channel. I still think Spider-Man number one is probably the book to get. I think that's, you know, we're, we're kind of guessing which version is the one that we're seeing in this. And really, it could just be it, those inspired what J.J. Abrams and Henry Abrams did. Also, I don't even think those are the issues to get, Brian. I think the issue is going to be when he puts on the spider suit. Um, word is that we're going to see that in issue two. It looks like there's some not final cover art featuring Spider-Man on the cover, which that could be, um, uh, you know, Benji in that spider suit. We've also heard rumors from some of our sources, Brian, that he could be getting his own spider suit in issues three or four. So there could be multiple first appearances. And it's, again, it's why I was so bullish on this series. And, you know, we just talked about uh, with the Hickman X-Men pick that there are a, there is a trend in this, you know, market right now of books being driven by reader buzz. That's what this is. There's no movie coming. Now, yeah, I, I pointed to the poster on the wall and said, you know, this is made for Into the Spider-Verse. And I still firmly believe that. But nonetheless, this is driven because J.J. Abrams and Henry Abrams put a kick-ass story out last week. Um, nobody would care about these first appearances if the story was terrible. Yeah, there were a lot of boo birds. Yeah, there were ne some negative comments or some people who didn't agree. But you know what? That's going to happen anytime that you come out as strongly as I did for a book like that. But what I saw overwhelmingly is a lot of other people who kind of felt the same way I did, who didn't think this book was going to be anything going into it, read it and were like, oh my God, this is as, as good as anything that I've read right now. Um, and I just, I love to see that this reader buzz is, um, is really driving the market. And here's the other thing. This pick may be a pick that we see on the hot list again, Brian. And I say that because what I just said, I think issue two, we could see something. Issue three, we could see something. We just did issue two last week on the last call show. Um, we just talked about it. I have a feeling that that book is going to be an entry on the last call show every time it comes up for FOC. And I just think that they, we're going to be talking about this series probably for the duration of its run. It's a five-issue miniseries. And then who knows after that? Um, if, if Henry Abrams decides he wants to you know, stay on and continue a series, if that's something Marvel wants to do. Um, and I, you know, I've seen this before, Brad. You know where I've seen this before? Right down the road by my hometown in Charlotte, North Carolina – with Spider-Gwen. This reminds me so much of Spider-Gwen, um, where when Jason Latour created that character, um, it, it was laughed at. It was, you know, this is, oh, it's just, a, it's just another amalgamation character. It's not something to take serious. It's not something to um, view as having long-term value. But now how much long-term value does Spider-Gwen have? Um, with the multiverse, with the Spider-Verse, being so prevalent right now in both publishing and in movies. I think anything's possible with this character. 
I think both of those books, whether we're talking the uh, Last Avenger story number two or uh, uh, Spider Girl uh, 59. And there's another issue, I think 57, that people are calling like a cameo and putting some money into. I think all of it has value. But for me, I'm really paying attention to the one thing that he didn't really mention, which is that Spider-Man series itself, the books, the variants, the two per store variant. I think they definitely have to change his costume up or what's going to if he's wearing the same costume, there's not going to be much differentiation between yep. Spider-Man and Benji. So I do see him getting his own costume. And I think if you see that and then you see start seeing little kids cosplaying as him, you can start seeing that traction and that attention build up on that character. Um, it's also interesting to see you mentioned into the Spider-Verse, but it'll be interesting to see how just the Spider-Man movie rights play out with the whole MCU thing right now with Apple talking about buying Sony. They've heard that as well, but there's a lot of stuff to see how it plays out and if it's long term and how this story and if Benji gains traction, that's what speculation is all about. Me personally, I like what you said about Spider-Man. My personal opinion, I don't give a crap what he did pooping in diapers or any of that stuff. That's not the character that's going to draw me to. It's going to be the character you're seeing in the story. So for my collection, I'd go with the Spider-Man books. But great pick from Brian. And make sure you guys check out CBSI Presents Tales from the Flipside. Now we're going to shift gears and we are going to move into the cold list. Alright guys, it's your boy Carolina Chris 26 back at you with my cold pick of the week. And my cold pick of the week is Infinity Gauntlet sets 1 through 6. Now during the whole Infinity Gauntlet saga as it was playing out on the big screen, a lot of books started to go up of course. And uh, sets of 1 through 6, uh, sporadic sales of individual issues were going out. Um, but now sales are starting to go down. You can actually own you a copy. If you if you didn't have a copy beforehand or you sold your copy, now you can own you another copy for a fairly reasonable price. Because I've I've seen sales on eBay sets of one through six um, in September from around twenty six to sixty five to seventy dollars. Now compare that to June, July, August of this year, uh, sets were being sold for seventy five to one hundred seventy five. But but but. There's people on eBay selling sets for around sixty to six hundred dollars. That's not confirmed sales, you know. But um, confirmed sales are around twenty six to seventy dollars. You know what I'm saying on eBay, um, and that's the the month of September. Like I have a copy of uh, Infinity Gauntlet uh, number one nine point six signed by Joe Rubenstein and Jim Starlin. You know, hey, I thought I was going I was going to sell that. Maybe I should have when I had the chance. I don't know, Matt. CGC copies of number one are actually, um, they're fetching a, a little bit of a penny, you know. I could actually make a profit if I sold that right now. You know what I'm saying? I probably, yeah, most definitely. But, um, and, and it's an autographed copy. Now, if it was a 9.8, yeah, I definitely could make it. People are funny when it comes to 9.6s for some reason. If it's not a 9.8, they're like, eh, no. But sets of one through six, non-graded copies are selling for around $25, $26 to $70 a set. So, if you play it hard enough and you're in an auction and you're patient, you just might walk away with a set for a fairly reasonable price. You know what I'm saying? I never win in auctions myself, but uh, you know that's me. I don't got no luck at anything, man. You know what I mean? Um, that is my cold pick of the week, guys. Let me know what you think. Do you agree? Do you think it's crap? What? Please, let me know, guys. That's what I'm here for. So, thanks, guys. I appreciate y'all for letting me come back. Be safe, guys. God bless. And happy Comic Book Wednesday. Peace. Carolina Chris26 back with another cold pick this time. Great. I really like this pick. Talk about Infinity Gauntlet. We always talk about movie spec once. It gets hot with the announcement, gets hot with the trailer, the movie comes, and then you start seeing that decline. And this is a perfect example of it. Um, we had Adam from Patreon on here kind of talking about this similar, but not this specific. He was talking about those movie spec books with the MCU. This is talking about Infinity Gauntlet series in particular. And he makes a good point. I also remember right before the spike on this, we could get that Infinity Gauntlet number one, 9.8. For about 60 bucks. 
So seeing them sell now, even on the decline for like 200 bucks or whatever they're fetching, is still a good price. You're seeing some of that residual spike from the movies. But as a set, these are kind of cold right now. But it is a classic storyline within Marvel lore. So if you can get it for cheap, definitely pick it up just to have it in your PC. Yeah, you definitely stole my thunder with that Adam reference. Um, Adam from the YouTube channel Strange Tales to Collect, um, member of the Simplemans Comics Patreon family, he definitely highlighted these like phase previous phase spec plays. And I think that this is a prime example. I mean, this, this is probably the best example, right? Because this got red hot because of the movie stuff. But what you said is true. And look at what the market is doing. These, um, these reader buzz picks are picking up. This is as reader buzz as it gets, but it's tougher to read this because it's an older, it's an older issue. So it's not like the younger crowd is reading it. But this is an observation I had, um, again, and I, I talk about it. it, there's so much value in it. If you guys are selling comic books, set up at your local shows, even if you just do small shows, because you learn and you see so much, you see buyer reaction to things. Um, I have a stack of Infinity Gauntlet number ones. Um, I bought that book leading up to those movies. I bought that book with a fervor. Anytime I saw that book, $20 or under in, in near mint condition, I was buying it. So I've got, I've still got probably a half dozen of them. Um, and I've got them priced pretty healthy for raw copies, like 50, 60 bucks, depending on whether it's newsstand or, you know, the direct edition. And so I had like them spread out on my table in a little section where I had some empty space. The average buyer, Brian, our age, we've already got that book, right? I mean, we've already, we've had it. Um, so we probably had it before the movie news because it was just such an important book. So even when the movie news came out, then you're like younger speculation crowd got on it. You know who walks every time they walk by that book is in awe of seeing like six of those it was kids because now kids know about this book um, because even your kids, Brian, as young as they are, they saw those Infinity Saga movies, right? All they knew They're... was Iron Man died. Okay, but you know, they'll re... because because they love Far From Home so much. But yeah, they're mm -hmm. starting to pick up that interest in it, and they're going right. to be getting there. And they'll they'll, they'll be soon. watching them, right? And at some point, um, they're like my my youngest daughter has an affinity for Thanos for whatever reason she likes villains, um, and I think that these movies are so classic. Our kids are going to watch these movies, right? And they're going to want these books at some point. So it's more of a long-term play. It's definitely cold right now. They've dropped from that initial movie hype. But that's why I'm still real bullish. I'm not going to go dump my copies. I mean, obviously, at the prices I paid, I could I could make my money back and still make profit, right? I could put them on eBay in a live auction, and I'll probably you know come out doing okay. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stick to the price that I've got them at there. Near mint copies, black cover. Um, you know, it's, it's not a book that is readily available in that kind of a condition. And you know what? I've already made my money on this book. And seeing the way kids walk up to that book and go, you know, oh, that's the Infinity Gauntlet. And then hearing like the dad tell the kid the story. And I'm talking about kids that are 8, 10, 11, 12 years old. Kids that a $50 book is still very pricey for them. Um, those are the kids that as they become 16, 18, 21, 22, um, if we can keep this market as healthy as it currently is or healthier, they're going to want those books. Um, and that's something I think we forget, Brian. I think we forget within the spec cycle um, that there's younger kids growing up getting in this community. And that's also what's great about YouTube. Um, not necessarily to pat our own backs because I think you and I tend to have a audience of a certain age, I'll say. Um, but there are certainly other channels and other YouTubers who cater to a younger audience a lot more. And, um, you know, that – and it's also why, Brian, you and I don't try not to curse on the channel, right? Because we know that there are kids who are watching. There are kids who are learning through our channel. Um, and as those kids get older, they're going to want these items. And in wanting the items, you're going to see increased sales. You're going to see a new generation come up. And those movies are going to be classic forever, um, no matter how many phases they get into, a kid who's trying to watch those future phases, you know the dad is going to say, son, you got to go back and you got to watch those older movies. And it's going to happen. Um, Thanos isn't going anywhere. He's going to be a key part of Marvel lore as long as the MCU exists. So I think that that's a safe bet for long-term uh, money. I think if you can find, as Carolina Chris mentioned, 
If you can find people willing to sell those books underpriced, grab them. I think uh, I think they're worth grabbing. And you know, he mentions Infinity Gauntlet, but I'll even bring in Infinity War, which is even worse. You can see that set go sometimes for like twenty dollars or less for the set. Um, I think there's long term value in those sets. I think that there's uh, there's going to be a market for them at some point. But you got to be willing to play the long game. And Simpleman's Comics family, you know, I'm a long game guy. So that's why I'm here saying that's why I love cold picks. There's always opportunity in them. And with that being said, we're going to roll right into the next cold pick. What's up, comic family? Got to get those reps in. Best beer in the game. That's what we're going for. It ain't easy being cheesy. And I'm back with my cold pick. My cold pick this week is near and dear to my heart and many other hearts. And it is Akira. So with the news that they've indefinitely postponed this movie, uh, prices are cooling off, sales are cooling off. We saw prices hit close to 400 for a 9.8 this summer, this spring and this summer. Prices for the 9.6s did spike too. Um, it's definitely cooling off now that we know that the director is moving on to do um, Thor 4 first before they do this movie. So hopefully they do come back and do this movie, but for now, it's a great buying opportunity. And if you're like me kind of a completionist collector don't miss out on that second print i don't know if you guys can read it but that second print does have a different price on it with a little bit different type on it uh have never been able to figure out the print run on that second print and they don't come up very often and when they do come up finding them in near mint condition is pretty difficult so great buying opportunity akira modern key in my opinion Jack, Brian, Pinky's out. Peace out. See you guys next week. So when I first heard he was talking about this, I thought it was going to be Shakira talking about these hips don't lie and stuff like that. But we're talking about Akira, which could mean about the same to me because I've never been a fan of this book. This is just one of those books that I was never hyped on, didn't care about. I honestly, I never even read a single issue of this. So I'm going to have to just recuse myself from this conversation about this cold pick because to me it's always been cold because i've never had anything to do with it you know what brian um i'm almost in the same boat as you i'm not a big like japanese manga type guy um this has never been my style um here's the thing though i will say we've been waiting for this like i feel like as long as i've been in comics there's been talk about an akira movie it's one of those like independent series is that just people love I've never fully gotten it. Um, it's not my type of thing. But people in the YouTube, you know, comic community, Simpleman's Comics Family, Bolo Nation, CBSI Nation, you guys all know. I've often said, like, you can't mock another person's fandom because you can make money off of something you're not interested in that somebody else is. I'll tell you what the best spec advice Andy gave you in that video is that second print. Andy put something in our CBSI Facebook group about the second print. He mentioned uh, he was thinking about getting it graded. And you know, people really hated on him. Like, oh, that book will never be worth anything. Go search for the first print. Go search for the second print. The first print is pretty plentiful. It's out there, right? And now it's tough to get in, in high grade, but so is the second print. Second print, there's like three on eBay. None graded. So if you were looking to make an Akira spec play, that second print um, – could be a tough one, could be one to keep your eye on. And the market is changing about the way we view first and second prints. We've seen that. Um, second prints have become more and more popular. So um, I think that's a good spec play if you're in the Akira boat. Um, you may already feel like, you know, I'm already invested in Akira, but have you gotten into the second print? That could be some like next level type thing. Either way, um, let us know in the chat, uh, you know, if you're hating on me and Brian because we're not Akira guys. Let us know. We'd love to hear why we need to read this series. So we're going to roll into the next cold pick coming from Mike Morello. Hey, everybody. Mike Morello again from CBSI's Cover Tunes with my cold pick this week. And this week, I'm really sorry, but it is Jenica of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. My house spec changes from week to week. Um, number 51 was a $50 book. 40 45 bucks even at its you know sort of low during those first few weeks now 10 to 15 bucks um 20 if you're lucky um number 95 first cameo appearance as a turtle was also a 50 dollars book now down again 10 bucks maybe even less um nine eights are down in half from 200 to 100 
um, it, they're all down 40 to 50 percent across the board. The one in 10 is 45 to 50 now. Again, if you're lucky, you couldn't have touched that for less than 100, 125 bucks um, about a month ago. The second print down to cover price. The Eastman second print 30 bucks and just sitting on eBay. Um, 96, the first full appearance cover A it was a 15, 20 dollar book down to cover price. Um, the one in 10 down as low as 15 bucks. You couldn't touch that for less than 50 for a while. Um, 97, the, uh, sort of the, the first kind of like uh, story with her in it is sitting on shelves. Still, you got the San Diego comic-con convention exclusive, which still does well two fifty, and the Eastman exclusive at a hundred, but let's face it. That's only diehard turtle fans buying those. That's not, there's no meat on the bone with that. Um, I think that's largely done. So, I mean, will she pop again at some point? Perhaps unlikely, but it looks like she's already kind of forgotten and on her way to becoming the next Venus de Milo. She's cold. That's my cold pick. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. So I think Mike's cold pick is a great example of the speculation market in general right now. You saw everyone get hot when the news broke. We, oh, we're going to have a female turtle. Everything breaking loose. You saw these prices shoot up. Now you saw issues 96, 97 come out. And I don't think much happened in those books. So what happened? The shiny object was over here now. So then you saw that market shift to go over to, you can name anything. You can name Hickman books. You can name Absolute Carnage. You can name whatever was the hot book at the time. So naturally, the attention goes over here. You see the books drop a little bit. These books are still selling, though, aren't they, Jack? What do you think about this cold pick? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't actually consider this a cold pick. And that's no slight on Mike. I think it's a colder pick, meaning that it's colder than it was at its height. But everything becomes like that, right? What goes up inevitably comes down. Um, but if you look, I, Mike said, like, you know, 95 is going for about $10. That's not really the case. It's going for about $20, $25. So just look at that in and of itself. If you didn't know that at, at one point there was a fervor that sent it to $50, you're talking about a cover price IDW book. Now, I got so much crap for even talking about IDW books on a regular basis on this channel early on. We're talking about an IDW book that's selling right now for $20 plus $5 shipping um, regularly. Um we're talking about a one in 10 incentive that the last sale was 65 plus $10 shipping. So $75 for a one in 10 incentive. He mentioned the, um, the, uh, Eastman Virgin, uh, variant, you know, I, I was able to sell 10 of those in the past couple months. Um, plus how many for, store exclusive variants were done and how many stores sold completely out of them. Talk of Frankie's comics, um, you know, boomed through those 97s, uh, Killed those 97s. Amazing, that Vasquez cover. And again, the, no disrespect to that cover, but you can tell like they rushed that because they were trying to get those out real quick. Um, the 98 Delato that Frankie's did did extremely well. Um, you know, and it's it, it was all over the place. The Comics and Ponies, the company that Eastman's affiliated with, they did second print variants. Um, the image you've got on the graphic is the second print with that Ben Bishop variant cover. That book only hit about six, seven bucks, but that's to be expected when I you first spoiled print. it. I haven't even shown the graphic yet. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but spoiler alert: uh, when when a first print hits the price that it hits, the second print's going to do that. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head that it was more not so much that nothing happened. Nothing happened in ninety six, ninety seven. She got her bandana, right. but we all knew that was going to happen because Tom Waltz. Again, guys, it's not us who ruins pre-FOC speculation. It's when the writer tells you what's going to happen and he has 100,000 Twitter followers and then everybody shares it all over the place. That's what, what does it. I wish I had that kind of reach and penetration in the market. Um, again, I'd be working for a publishing company if that was the case. Um, but hey, IDW, boom, any of you guys out there, get at us, right? But you know, that's the reality is um, that's what changes pre-FOC spec. Another thing that greatly affects pre-FOC spec is the amount of stores that did store exclusives for that. They saw money, they got in. Um, by the way, these books still sold. Um, you're still regularly seeing like 96 cover A and B sell for 15. You're seeing uh, 97 A and B sell for 15. That's still a few dollars over cover price. And again, if you look at the average Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue, that's not always the case. Um, but you know what? We talk spoilers on this channel, right, Brad? So today is New Comic Book Day. We're filming this on Tuesday. 
but today is new comic book day, which means the issue 98 has hit the stands, right? Well, guess what? I happen to read this issue already. So we're going to talk about what happens in issue 98, which I think is going to affect the speculation of this character even further. Don't we have a heel turn? We have a heel turn. Ra- Raphael quits the uh, the Turtles. He's no longer a team member. He seems to side with the Mutanimals. Um, Baxter Stockman, the longtime villain, becomes mayor. And they uh, end up unleashing um, – when I say that, I don't mean Raphael, but uh, uh, a – kind of like mutant bomb is unleashed that turns humans into mutants. And a bunch of humans at the end of the issue get turned into various mutants. Now, I think when this video is live, right, by the time this video hits the channel, I think the talk, Brian, people are going to be having is, well, obviously by issue number 100, the turtles are going to try to clean this up, right? They can't just have people walking around New York City, everybody's a mutant. So they're going to have to create an antidote that turns mutants back into humans, right, Brian? So you know where I'm going with this. Is Jenica going to take that um, Going to take that yeah. antidote and turn back into a, a person? But shout out to my man Carter Lee from uh, the uh, Simpleman's Comics family Patreon who uh, hits me with these uh, – issues a day early and uh a lot of issues and really aided the bolo show this week so shout out to him um who made a great point Raphael quit the team right what if he takes the antidote what if jenica stays and we get the first appearance of Raphael as a human for a period of time wouldn't that be the biggest thing in speculation we'd have a jenica situation all over again but what would it but, but it's an antidote it's not a so wouldn't it just turn them into a small turtle again if it was an antidote? It's comics, Brian. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Anything can happen, man. And we don't <laughs> – the truth is we don't We don't know. Maybe it'll uh, turn into a zebra. But I, I just – I'm just throwing that out there. I, Carter mentioned that. I think it's a great point. It's a good counterpoint. But I think naturally what speculators are going to do, Brian, is they're going to go into Jenica panic. And they're going to say, this character's done. Um – they're going to start dumping their stuff. I, that still doesn't make a lot of sense to me because the, the writer who created the character, Sophia Campbell, is taking over after issue 100. So why would she take over and not write the character that she created? Um, so again, I still think all of those people who dump, that's the beauty of the cold list. I think, like I said, I don't think that Jenica is cold. I think she's colder than she was at her absolute scorching hot. She was so hot at one point when she wasn't on the hot list. We had to bring in Sarah from the Simple Men's Comics you, uh, Patreon family and have her jump on here, interrupt the show, hack into the show, and give her hot pick. Um, I, I think when you come from that level, anything, any sort of depreciation looks like it's cold. I don't think Jenica's cold. I, if you look at like sale sold listings, she's still moving copies. But I do think it's going to get colder because I do think once people read issue ninety eight, their minds are naturally going to go to see Jenica's not permanent. She's going away. It's going to happen. And and there's also like issue number one hundred covers that don't feature Jenica on the cover. And I think I've already started to hear rumblings from people about that. So anything can happen. Remember that cover art usually is not final. And can be subject to change, like wrestling cards subject to change. But uh, I think that this is a saga we're going to see play out, Brian. And we may have Jenica back on the hot list. And we may have her back on the cold list. It could kind of go either way at the point that we're at right now. Right. But either way, agree with it being cold. Or at least, uh, what's that, gazpacho? <laughs> the cold soup? <laughs> yeah. Right. So, great pick, Mike. And we're going to go into the last pick on the cold list and that comes from peter renna what's going on everybody this is peter renna back with my cold pick for this week and staying with the x books i'm gonna have to say that wolverine's daughter rain is cold and while this copy of this book might be still selling for about 37 bucks to 50 bucks right now it was up over a hundred dollars just back in july there was multiple copies selling every day lots with five and six moving but now 
yeah, yeah, some are still buying this, but I don't know why. I don't know why anybody cares. Is anybody paying attention to Wolverine's daughter, Rain? Like, what issue are they up to? Eight? Nine? I don't know. Not reading it. I don't think any other books heated up. The second print, one in 25, sells for a little bit, but I think that's more of a novelty in that she's on the cover. Big, big whoop de doo Nobody's buying the regular second print or third print like they do with these other hot, you know, Marvel second and third prints. But, I don't know. It's, it's Wolverine's daughter. Who... Who really cares? I mean, honestly. I mean, he's got more kids than Antonio Cromartie. I mean, she's forgotten about. It's cold. That's all I got to say. It's cold. I'm just not interested, and I could care less how that story is even going to end. But, yeah, what do I know? Cold pick. So Peter's cold pick, we're talking about Rain, Wolverine's daughter, which I think this is a perfect, exa which I think this is a perfect example of the effect from FOMO. People, this book came out. Everyone went skyrocket over it. You saw the book take off on the secondary market. People was buying it up. Wolverine's daughter. I think we even talked on the Bolo show. I think I even mentioned this dude has more daughters than Antonio Cromartie, just like Peter just said. I was never high on this, but then again, it was also I just didn't care about the character. But I think you're seeing that FOMO start to die down. Who knows what something might come off of this character later. Maybe Donny Cates White's Wolverine, and then we retcon this into some major character. Who knows? But what do you think about this pick? Well, yeah, um, it's it's a good pick. Um, I'm going to compare it to Jenica. Because I can't go and say, like, this is, like, totally cold in the same way I said about Jenica. Because we're still talking about, like, he mentioned a $37 cover A, right? Um, it's kind of hard to call that cold. That's still well well over cover price if you were able to find that on your lcs shelf tomorrow you're still gonna be doing backflips because you're gonna be you know turning a great roi but yeah you and i talked about this book when it came out both of us were like this is nothing i don't understand you know what about dakin my man i mean you know people forget about him like there's so many children of wolverine um you know it seems like nobody's talking about honey badger anymore who's not i know not before you kill me not a child of wolverine but is related to the speculation, I mean, it was that was uh, uh, you know X 23s partner in crime. It's funny the way people's attention shifts. So this character came out, everybody went crazy, and everybody's attention has shifted. Um, but I think where Jenica is differs is Jenica. You had issue fifty one spiking um, for like that first appearance. You know, as a human, 95, first appearance as a, a turtle, 59, that like origin issue battle with, with Shredder. And then you had um, 97, although overprinted, where she gets the mask. This is really a one issue pick. Um, yeah, there's a second print. There's a second print variant. He mentioned that the regular second print isn't selling. Well, we've talked about that on the channel, haven't we, Brian? Anytime they do these second print incentive variants, stores just over-order to get those incentive variants. They're only trying to make their profit off the incentives. I see that second print on shelves all the time. It's it's sitting right now. Um, and the next one that seems to be getting that treatment is Venom 18. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but Venom 18 has a 1 in 25 second print variant. It's the black and white version of the Immortal Wraparound variant. And a lot of people are excited about the immortal wraparound variant, but again, that's going to make the actual second print utterly worthless. That's just happened time and time again on the market. Um, and these trends just tend to continue. So, um, I'm not surprised that we're talking about rain in this light. Um, it's all about what's the plan. Now, if I was going to be say positive about this, I would say, will Hickman incorporate her into some sort of X-Men plan going forward if that happens she'll see a resurgence but that's what scared me about this spec brian from the get-go is we have so much x-men stuff going on right this isn't part of that this is part of this like charles soul um marvel comics presents series we don't really know where this is going to play out with the rest of the mcu this is really just a wolverine driven story um you know it's a cameo and first appearance pop off type book. That's it. Um, I, I don't know. We're gonna have to wait and see. Something's gonna have to be done with her. I highly doubt we're gonna see her in a movie. Um, so you're really hoping that another writer says, you know what? I want to write about Rain, or Marvel says we're gonna do a Rain solo series. Um, but short of that, I think this downtrend with this character is gonna continue as people just move on. And you know, that's modern speculation. 
So that's why I would advocate to anybody out there. If you're collecting, that's different. If you're collecting, don't buy up the ladder. We tell you that all the time, right? If you're just a collector and you want to keep the books, wait. If you're a speculator, sell when something's hot. I could be wrong about Jenica, but I'm not going to cry. You know why? Because I'm not going to tell you how many copies of Jenica's first appearance I've sold over the last several months. I'm at a point now where I barely have any. Um, I think I have one copy of 91 cover, 95 cover A left. That's it. And I had several dozen because I saw a market that was feverish for it. I went ahead and sold. Um, I would hope that if you were speculating, that's what you did with your rain books. Um, but people just have a tendency to hold on too long. They, they want to maximize their value and that it burns you nine out of 10 times. And Brian, you and I have talked about this. Um, you don't want to cry over missed financial opportunity. It hurts a lot more when you're stuck holding a book that then drops in value. So um, if you bought this for a speculation play, my suggestion would be go ahead and take your $37 and feel good about it. Um, you always hear people, you're always talking about if you're financially into this book, if you're financially into that book, if you're speculating, you always hear financing. Here's the thing also, especially just my take on it, my opinion. If you are putting that much money into comic books that you're relying on financial stability or making money or so much that you get so pissed off that someone makes a video about it and possibly ruins your chance to flip a book ten times over, you have a problem. Not the people making the video. So with that being said, that's our hot and cold list and I'm going to bring it up on the screen right now. So, Andy, we got previews in ash cans. Caroline Chris 26, we got Titans. Beard Man, Comic Man Andy, we got Golden Age Comics. Mike gave us G.I. Joe from Marvel. Peter gave us Hickman's X-Men Run. And then Brian gave us Benji Parker. And then on the cold list, we had Chris with Infinity Gauntlet sets. Andy again with Akira. Mike with Jenica Turtle. And then Peter with Wolverine's Daughter. What do you think of the list? I love it. This I feel like this is one of our better lists. This was a fun list to talk about. And I want to thank our newest regular members of the Hot and Cold Show, Carolina Chris26, Comic Man Andy, and Brian McClay, on doing an excellent job seamlessly fitting into the roster, stepping up, and killing it week in and week out. Right. So there's our Hot and Cold list. Make sure you turn in tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern where we have the Bolo Show it's pre-recorded, but we will have a premiere with the live chat in there. Well, we are recovering this week's hottest releases from first appearances, reader buzz, variant buzz, and of course, Jack will have a long-term play. But then, Friday night, we have another premiere. What's that, Jack? That is, of course, my favorite show on the channel right now, The Last Call Show. That is the pre-FOC show, where we are talking about books that are about 23 days out um, from being released to the public, you get about a three-day window to make these orders and to lock them in with your LCS, to lock them in with your online retailer, to make sure you secure your copies, not just be guaranteed to have those copies pending allocation, but to also make sure you're getting the lowest possible price as many uh, retailers and online retailers offer steep discounts for those who order pre-FOC. So we are excited to talk about pre-FOC spec on, on this channel and not just spec, but, you know, reader buzz, of course, that is, that is synonymous with everything we do and trust and believe no matter how many people don't like us talking about it. We have no plans of stopping it and we will continue to do it. It is our favorite time of the week to sit back, have a couple of adult Kool-Aids and talk comics. Right. With that being said, make sure you guys click that thumbs up button. And let us know in the comments, what do you think is hot and cold right now within the comic community? Not single issues. If you want to give single issues, that's fine. But we're looking more for those market trends. And who knows, might get your comment featured on this show. But with that being said, we will see you right here tomorrow night, 9 p.m. for the Bolo Show.